Um, my name is Teresa Maines, and I'm a PhD student in counseling psychology at the University of British Columbia in Dr. Betty's lab. And I'm happy to host this event for Dr. Betty and to provide a little bit of an introduction to the speaker series and to get us started today. Um, if you've attended previous talks, then um, what I'll be sharing today is a bit familiar. So go ahead and stretch your legs or take a break and then come back in a couple minutes and we'll get started on the actual talk of the speaker series. Okay, so this is the Confronting Hegemonic Ideas speaker series brought to you by Dr. Betty's Counseling and Psychotherapy RTS Lab in partnership with the CMPS program and the Heterodox Academy. The Confronting Hegemonic Ideas speaker series, as I said, is supported in part by the Heterodox Academy. However, the opinions expressed in this event are of the individuals themselves and are not necessarily reflecting the views of the Heterodox Academy. This speaker series has hosted seven events. This is the seventh and final event of the speaker series. All of the events, if you are interested in viewing the previous events, can be viewed on the lab YouTube page. The intention of this series is to increase awareness of heterodox viewpoints and inconvenient facts and findings that do not conform to hegemonic narratives and dominant perspectives in order to promote critical thinking, intellectually rigorous research, and the ability to serve a broader range of counseling clients. In order to facilitate this better, there will be a Zoom room uh, provided at the end of this talk where you will be given 30 minutes to have an open discussion about the, the thoughts and feelings that you may have had during this talk. I will be posting a link to this Zoom session in the chat and if you're unable to access the link through the chat, some people have said that in the past, I will be posting my email address as well and you can email me directly if you're having issues and I'll send that link right on to you. Just some considerations as we get into this, this talk. Um, there, there are some ethical standards that we follow as counselors and as future psychologists. And some of these um, ethical standards are in our code of ethics and they're, they're listed right here. And so we, are, we believe that this speaker series helps to foster the ethical standards that we adhere to as counselors and psychologists in order to engage with our clients that may present with heterodox or unconventional ideas or, or who may um, have different opinions or experiences than we do as counselors and psychologists. Here's a brief content advisory. Um, you may encounter perspectives or research in this speaker series that are uncomfortable or challenging and would encourage you to then talk about these reactions that you may have with colleagues, peers, or supervisors. And we hope that these experiences will prepare you to better serve the clients that you'll engage with in the future as mental health professionals and as researchers, as you are likely to engage with a wide variety of clients and colleagues who will have different opinions than yourself. Uh, a big um, rationale for this study is to be able to help counselors and psychologists engage with clients who are different from them. And, uh, a uh, precursor to this was a study by Johnson and Peacock who found that social studies or social services graduates reported difficulty engaging with clients who differed from them once they graduated from their university degrees. There's a bunch of quotes here from participants in this study and the, some themes that emerged were that they felt unprepared to have actual conversations with their clients that differed from them. They felt that their university degrees did not prepare them. Um, Specifically, Sarah said, I think that you can not only help empathize and understand those things, but in terms of if you were having a disagreement with somebody, it also helps you understand where they're coming from. Her understanding and her desire to be able to have these kinds of conversations in university that she didn't get to have. A couple other quotes, um, they started running into people who were different than them and they weren't prepared to have these conversations. Um, they think the university for the most part did not prepare them for real conversations about ideological differences. So the intention of this speaker series is to alleviate some of this that may be occurring in universities where students are not being prepared to have difficult conversations with clients. Um, here's a list of all the past speakers. As I said, you can find all of these speakers on our YouTube channel. Okay, um, thank you for tuning to that brief introduction. Let me stop sharing and I will introduce our speaker today. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Betty. 
who is an associate professor of counseling psychology at the University of British Columbia. Prior to this, he was an associate professor of psychology at Western Washington University. He is also a registered psychologist and has worked in independent practice for about 15 years. His research interests are multifaceted, but include multicultural, cross-cultural, and international counseling and psychotherapy. His list of designations and awards is numerous, but is includes but is not limited to being a Killam Laureate and a UBC Green College Leading Edge Scholar, and being awarded the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research Career Investigator Scholar Award, and a Distinguished Member Award from the Counseling Psychology Section of the Canadian Psychotherapy Psychological Association. As a principal applicant, Dr. Betty has been awarded 44 grants and fellowships totaling over $1 million and has been on project teams being awarded an additional $600,000. He is the organizer of the Confronting Hegemonic Ideas speaker series. And I will now turn the time over to Dr. Betty. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Teresa, for the introduction. And thank you to the people in the audience for being here on a July day. Uh, I'm actually away at a conference um, in Colorado, so I'm actually tuning in from, from Colorado, and I'm glad that there's no internet issues. Uh, we have a nice, warm, sunny day. Uh, I'm not sure what it's like for the people local in Vancouver, uh, but uh, again, thank you for making time during July, which isn't uh, usually a typical academic talk time of year. Um, so my talk is titled, Racial, Ethnic, Cultural, and National Disparities in Psychological Treatment Outcomes are inevitable. Psychotherapy as a Western cultural healing practice. Um, if anybody happens to be a medical anthropologist in the audience, this is not going to be new information, at least like the higher level concepts aren't going to be new. Um, some of the details may be new as applied to psychotherapy, uh, but people in anthropology have been studying topics like this uh, for since he emerged of the discipline, but these ideas are a little bit newer to psychology and they seem to contradict some of the, the sense of counseling and psychotherapy as sort of universal or scientific or, or things that we can take all over the world to reduce uh, you know, mental health treatment gaps. And so as I, I wanna give some background context for my ideas before I sort of get into my, well, I guess my mainstream ideas here that I'll, my main ideas I'll be presenting. And so I want to just say something that's quite obvious is that there are many ways to treat or resolve psychological issues such as what we commonly call clinical depression in the West. Oops. And so, for example, in uh, Bali, in Indonesia, they have a malasti ceremony. And during the ceremony, which is to purify oneself from the world, uh, Hindus can go into a deep trance of people who participate. I have a reference at the bottom. It's one of many, but apparently this is a treatment for depression. Okay, let's take another healing practice. Acupuncture. Uh, I think many people are familiar with acupuncture, but it involves putting needles into certain points of the body. There's a systematic review of RCTs at the bottom there in a very reputable journal. So somehow this and it is, one of the key is a treatment of traditional Chinese for depression medicine. that works. In recent decades, acupuncture has become popular in the United States. Let's talk about yoga as another way of treating depression. I have a reference there again at the bottom, but somehow this is an effective treatment for psychological issues. Let's look at some religious healing. So reading or hearing uh, the scriptures of the Guru Granth Sahib is considered effective treatment for many mental health conditions uh, for six. There's a reference at the bottom, but for six, this is an effective treatment for depression. Okay, let's look at the Quran. 
Quran is a central religious text of Islam, there's a reference at the bottom there again, one of many, but reading the Quran or listening to somebody read the Quran is therapeutic and is an effective research back treatment for depression. <laughs> Okay, let's look at Coranderismo. It's a treatment approach in Mexico. It involves uh, various rituals like prayer, herbal medicine, uh, spiritualism, massage, and psychic healing. There's, again, one of many references at the bottom, but this is an effective treatment for depression. So I want everybody to take a moment and if you have a piece of paper beside you can jot this down. If not, just make a mental note. But I hope everyone can just take a, a couple seconds to identify what's one thing that these indigenous cross-cultural healing practices all have in common, the ones that I've shown you, as well as all others that you're aware about. And after you've answered that question, please take a, a moment again and either jot down or make a strong mental note of the answer to this question. What do indigenous cross-cultural healing practices like the ones I've shown you have in common with counseling and psychotherapy? Of course, I fully realize that what we're calling indigenous and cross-cultural depends on which rock you're standing on, in other words, which culture you're in. So I'm speaking from a Western context in calling other things cross-cultural or other things cultural. But just take a, exclude that, take a moment and say, well, what are these practices I've just shown you have in common with counseling and psychotherapy? Because those practices all have evidence of various types, even Western evidence, that they're effective treatments for depression, anxiety, and virtually all the psychological disorders that map onto that culture. So there are different ways of doing this, and there's lots of medical anthropological accounts of this or different models. The one I like is Frank's and Frank's model, which is actually written in psychotherapy journals, but really comes at it from an anthropological perspective. So Frank's model or Frank and Frank's model is a superordinate or meta model of counseling and psychotherapy and all other sociocultural healing practices. From this perspective in which you root the healing practice within the culture of, the, of where it emerged, we can consider counseling and psychotherapy as akin to traditional North American, Western European healing practices. And from Frank's model, there were four things that cut across all sociocultural healing practices, including psychotherapy. So when you look at acupuncture, you think of reading from the Guru Granth Sahib, everything I've shown you here and everything else that's a culturally sanctioned healing practice has four things in common. Number one, a healing setting or culture. Um, Every culture has certain settings that they designate as this is a place for healing. This is a place for getting better. For example, in the West, this could be the counseling office. When you go to a counselor's office, you're expecting to try to get better, you're expecting to try to heal. It's a place in which you try to get over your depression, anxiety, family conflict, whatever is there. Number two, all cultures have a or sorry, all healing practices have a, a rationale or a myth in common, a story they tell you. The rationale or the story must fit into the client's expectations and attitudes reasonably well, but at least fit within the broader cultural context that they exist in. It has to make conceptual sense based on their cultural conditioning. So, for example, in counseling and psychotherapy, the rationale we provide could be a psychodynamic theory or a solution-focused rationale, or virtually the other 300,000 theoretical orientations we have, each one of them tells a story 
a rationale for what's wrong with the client and how to get better. Every cultural healing practice has rituals. We tend to call them techniques or interventions in, in the West when we talk about psychotherapy, but something like dream analysis, the miracle question, the ABCD analysis, every cultural healing practice, including counseling and psychotherapy, have rituals. And every cultural healing practice, including counseling and psychotherapy, have a sort of emotionally charged, connected relationship with the healer. Um, in the West, we call this a client counsel relationship uh, or a therapeutic alliance or something along those lines, a therapeutic relationship. But those four things are in common. Now, here is a visual representation of um, Frank and Frank's model. As you can see, the healing setting, the culture, the myths and rationales, the rituals and the techniques, and the emotionally charged relationship. Those are the four components. So essentially, those are the four factors that give counseling and psychotherapy and all other indigenous healing practices their potency. And direct tests of Frank and Frank's model and or its components support it. And there's four meta-analyses I've listed there, uh, but there's a lot of articles that support this. Um, most of them are from anthropology, admittedly, but there's a lot of literature out there, particularly if you look beyond psychology and counseling literature. Okay, so with that background, and um, I know that uh, there's a Q&A feature, so uh, please post your questions to the Q&A feature. Um, I, I know there's a chat feature as well, but I know that we prefer the Q&A feature so that we can actively engage with the question. So as if questions or comments come up as you go along, please post them to the Q&A feature and I'll answer them at the end. But so now that you have that sort of background context, I want to talk about the issue that's sort of been bothering me for, for the last several years. Um, essentially, counseling and psychotherapy are sort of seen as universal scientific evidence-backed treatments, and they're being used with racial, ethnic, minority individuals in Western countries, as well as being promoted to non-Western countries. But counseling and psychotherapy, if you look at their history, were originally developed for and by Western individuals to address mental health concerns endemic to the Western world. But as I said, they're being increasingly utilized as a universal treatment method and globally exported at an unprecedented rate to eliminate widespread perceived disparities in access to clinical mental health care and treatment outcomes. So, oops. Yeah, so my main arguments are gonna be that racial, ethnic, cultural, and national disparities in counseling and psychotherapy outcome, in other words, some people will get better, some people won't, there'll be differences in effectiveness, are gonna be inevitable, even if we adapt counseling and psychotherapy in a cultural manner. And further, I'm gonna argue that counseling and psychotherapy's global relevance depends on consistency with local theories of cause and cure and on variables like acculturation, westernization, and Euro-American values. I'm also gonna highlight that important alternatives to culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy exist, and that longstanding indigenous mental health healing practices are underappreciated and, and underutilized. So I am also gonna say that we can reduce mental health disparities. We can basically improve the mental health of the world and it's possible, but we have to also include and utilize indigenous healing practices in isolation and in collaboration with uh, culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy. I'm also saying in my talk that a Western evidence base, in other words, research from Western countries should not of effectiveness and efficacy should not be the primary reason for implementing a particular Western psychological intervention in a non-Western country. Now, we typically, when we take these interventions, whether we critical to stress debriefing in a different country, which is another can of worms. When we take these interventions to other countries, we're really relying on a Western evidence bank saying these are evidence-based and now we're going to adapt into your culture. Instead, whether we use counseling and psychotherapy and other Western healing methods should be based on cultural correspondence. Okay, so now let me quickly talk about addressing disparities in North America with uh, culture, with the culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy. 
I am pleased to say, and I'm glad to say actually, because I am a counseling psychologist and I teach in a counseling psychology program, I supervise counselors and psychologists, and I have my own private practice that counseling and psychotherapy in North America and in Western Europe is very well supported. There's a lot of research evidence, but there's also a lot of evidence that says that all subgroups do not benefit equally. For example, racial, ethnic, minority individuals attend counseling and psychotherapy less, they drop out more frequently, and they show less positive results. Looking at research on practitioners, there's a huge variability in effectiveness between in mental health professionals. Some people are a lot more effective in working with racial and ethnic minority groups than other practitioners. Now, culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy has become the dominant paradigm for eliminating differences in therapeutic outcomes between REM individuals and dominant cultural groups. So we've said psychotherapy and counseling are effective. We realize it's less effective, doesn't work as well, not as attractive to racial ethnic minority individuals. So let's culturally adapt it. And there are some meta-analyses that show that culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy is more effective than applying conventional counseling and psychotherapy with racialized and minoritized individuals. Now, at the same time that CACP has picked up steam in North America, we start to see a parallel global movement, such as the World Health Organization Mental Health Gap Program. You're gonna see stats like this cited frequently in the global mental health literature. Uh, the one that I've seen so often is 75 to 90% of individuals in the world who can benefit from mental health treatment do not receive it. Let's stop and think about that for a second. Are we saying nine out of 10 people in the world aren't getting the treatment they deserve? First, we have to recognize that when they talk about mental health treatment, they're really talking about Western mental health treatment. We're saying 90% of the world doesn't have sufficient access to psychological treatments and psychiatric drugs. Now, a lot of initiatives have popped up often framed as ethical responsibility or social justice that are tasked with eliminating these disparities like access disparities by scaling up Western mental health treatments. And the wide pet perspective, including at the World Health Organization is, once we do this, we can scale up, we can culturally adapt, we will be able to eliminate the global mental health burden and the treatment gap in low and middle income countries. Now, the intention behind CACP is very admirable. What they're essentially saying, people who promote CACP, is that all individuals, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, or country, should equally benefit from counseling and psychotherapy. At the surface, nothing sounds wrong about that. As people start to do psychological treatments all over the world, issues have come up. Problems of cost, problems of feasibility, problems of accessibility, and problems of acceptability. Um, I remember that uh, when I'm probably, I think 2016, I was uh, in India for four months on research and I was giving free uh, lecture, I was giving lectures at universities and free training to counselors. And I was being pushed to uh, take my, my workshops to the rural areas and the villages. And I just refused because I didn't see it as appropriate to people who relied on one, they couldn't afford to come to a counselor psychotherapist. Um, it probably wasn't feasible to travel because some of them would have to travel 20, 30, 40 kilometers. So it wasn't accessible. And the ideas I would present at the universities just probably weren't acceptable. And that's sort of what a lot of the research is showing is that as you try to apply CACP and other Western treatments, these are some of the issues. Now, I'm one of the, bene one of the, the steps forward was the researchers and the leaders start to recognize some of these things, try to recognize that we can't just take psychotherapy, tweak it a little bit and apply it all over the world. So they start to disband some of the defining structural and organizational components of counseling and psychotherapy. For example, they started to have psychological treatments being applied by trained community health or trained community health workers, or even lay individuals, people with no training, no education, 
uh, like graduate education whatsoever, people with bachelor's degrees, people who just took diplomas. But psychological treatment started to be applied by people without that sort of formal psychological counseling type of training. That seemed to help with some of this, these issues. They started to take it out of the office. It was very bizarre and weird to go to a counselor's office in some parts of the world. And so that was an issue. Um, and so they started to take it out of the office, into the community, into other places. Um, they also started to really provide interventions completely outside of formal counseling and psychotherapy. But the pervasive Western bias is still evident. They still over rely on one to interventions as they have adapted and modified culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy. And they also rarely make use or integrate or even acknowledge traditional healers. Now, it's not all bad because Western based psychological intervention can be somewhat effective in, in non Western low and middle income countries. But the effect size is still smaller than what is typically seen in Western countries, even when culturally adapted. So, whereas I can say that psychotherapy and counseling are effective in North America, they seem to be less effective in non-Western LMI countries. So, a very tiny minority of, of people have really come out st with strong words against the global, imp global implementation of psychological treatments, at least Western psychological treatments. Uh, some people have called this, says that this takes advantage of a colonial mentality. In other words, you know, a lot of people, for whatever reason, being colonized or for whatever other reason, somehow see West as best. They are envious or they're jealous or they've internalized a sense of inferiority. And so promoting our Western healing practices of psychotherapy and counseling can take advantage of their sense of inferiority. Now, I remember that I was giving a keynote at a conference in India and um, my talk was about psychotherapy. And this was actually at uh, Christ University, the, uh, the Integrating Traditional Healing into Counseling and Psychotherapy Conference. And I think there was another association that was joined with that. And I gave my, I gave my talk. And after my talk, it was very typical, like some people stick around, they want to like talk and ask questions. But what really baffled me was, was that their questions were really about my talk at all, even my topic. They were just taken aback that, and I was in the U.S. at that point, so they were just kind of taken aback that some high-profile American professor, you know, from a well-known, you know, from a known university, has come here to our university or to our to India, and is sharing the knowledge. And they started asking me questions like, you know, like you have the best treatments for schizophrenia in 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 the U.S. The best treatments, the best doctors, and all of this are going off and off and off, until I had to tell them, yes, but look at the research. The research shows that you're actually better off in terms of schizophrenia treatment outcomes in India than you are in the U.S. So despite the best treatments, the best treatments, the most accessible treatments, the best doctors, the best research, if you look at the literature, you are actually have better outcomes of schizophrenia if you, in developing countries, in most developing countries. And that was a shock. And what was even more shocking was some of that research occurred at a hospital that was just about a 10 minute drive from the university where the conference was held at. And they weren't even aware about that, yet they could spew off references about Western schizophrenia research and this research and that research. And so that kind of highlighted that sometimes people are just predisposed to accept what we're talking about in the West. And so one critique people have made is, is promoting our psychotherapy all over the world can take advantage of a colonial mentality. Others have called it the hegemonic imposition of Western culture and political interests. That it serves our economic interests, our cultural interests, our power interests to sort of have psychotherapy and psychological treatments, psychiatric drugs, et cetera, exported. Some people call it culture imperialism. And the last one I kind of came across not that long ago was by Wessels, the tyranny of Western expertise. Another critique is even if you accept that psychotherapy is evidence-based all over the world and effective, should we still not respect the ethical principle of autonomy of their own healing practices, their own sort of ways of being in the world? 
So as you start taking psychiatric drugs and psychotherapy and counseling all over the world, it sort of ignores the culturally determined nature of mental disorder and transports sort of Western psychiatric concepts or disorders and interventions to another context, cultural context. And sometimes these are very incongruent and they can even marginalize indigenous systems of mental healing, which have been shown to be effective. I think it also sort of neglects that individuals in non-Western countries have long been overcoming their mental health concerns without counseling and psychotherapy. It's not like as soon as we invented CBT and took it all over the world, that all of a sudden we're the saviors and we now can fix their depression. They've been curing their depression, their anxiety, their marital conflicts for, for eons and generations without our Western healing methods. And I really love the Christopher et al. article in 2014 for the American Psychologist, and I put a few other examples there. But when we do this and we take psychological treatments and take them to other countries, non-Western countries, it can have some drastic negative consequences. I remember that uh, the, the Christopher article talked about the tsunami. Um, was, it, was it Sri Lanka? I can't remember exactly now, but it was Sri Lanka or somewhere over in Asia. And after the, the crisis, how, and I've been tongue in cheek here, I apologize for dramatic sake, I'm gonna say all these counselors and psychologists parachuted out of nowhere, descended upon that country, and we're doing their psychological treatments and support groups and all the rest of that with great intentions to sort of help the people out. And the funny thing is, is when you read accounts and the narratives and the lived experience of the psychologists and counselors who went there to help, you get a very heroic, selfless story. Now, step outside of that psychology literature and look at some of the anthropology literature and actually look at the research and what those people are actually saying. The people in those countries who were the receivers of our psychological help, our humanitarian help, whatever they wanted to call it, they told a very different story in many cases, if not most cases. It felt intrusive. It felt that it could create existential crises. A lot of the interventions that we did seem to actually increase post-traumatic stress reactions. It encompassed local support systems. And many times we violated social norms putting like people across caste in the same group for group counseling, um, putting your mixing gender when it wasn't culturally appropriate, talking about feelings, whatever we did, a lot of times it actually increased conflict and stigma. And so we put a bandaid on, but then when we, when we flew back to our home countries, the consequences continued of the harms that we caused. But this isn't well documented in psychology literature. Christopher's is one of the exceptions, but it's more documented in literature outside of psychology. And so again, if you stick with the lived experience and the research on the practitioners, you get a very heroic story. But when you look at the actual research and the voices of the people who are so-called being helped, there's a lot more murkiness in how helpful we were and whether we caused more harm than benefit as a cost of benefit analysis. The other thing is when we start taking our psychological treatments over the, all over the world and, we, and our psychiatric drugs, they're, again, based on certain assumptions that are Western assumptions or their assumptions of counseling and psychotherapy that just don't always make sense in another cultural context. So, for example, in psychotherapy, generally, we see ourselves as helping to reduce emotional suffering. That's what we do, you know, like a lot of our approaches are to stop emotional suffering. However, in many cultures, you need to emotionally suffer enough and sometimes people have to emotionally suffer more and they encourage that because this leads to spiritual transformation and growth. And so the emphasis is not on reducing emotional suffering. It's maintaining an ideal amount. And sometimes the best intervention is to suffer more. That doesn't fit the assumptions of, of counseling and psychotherapy usually. Now, there's always exceptions. I think there's a little bit of acceptance in like, acceptance of commitment therapy and existentialism, but generally we're trying to reduce suffering. Number two, psychological pain should be accepted. In counseling and psychotherapy, we're not trying to accept psychological pain, we're trying to stop it, we're trying to reduce it, get rid of it. So how does that make sense, that perspective, when you come across a client with a culture that says, we're not trying to reduce it, we're trying to accept it. 
Again, it violates most psychotherapy theories out there. Now, again, in, in counseling psychotherapy, we want our client to leave, to leave the, the session happy. Or if you have more experience, you realize that clients are going to leave every session happy, and it's still a good thing, but they should leave counseling and psychotherapy, the process, happy. They shouldn't leave dysphoric, down, depressed. But there are cultures out there in which that should be the norm. In Western culture, we have this message of happy-go-lucky. We should all be happy-go-lucky, click our heels, and kind of smile, and that's kind of our, our norm is up here. This is where we should be emotionally. But there are cultural groups that say, no, that is pathological. If you're that happy all the time, something's wrong with you. You don't understand how infantile and minuscule you are in this world, how little control you really have on, the, on your life. And so they actually believe a mild dysphoria. And I think I read this, it was one of the Buddhist cultures, one of the Buddhist religions. I remember reading some articles in which they really promoted a mild dysphoria. Something that we may call, we used to call it the dysthymic disorder, but something resembling that was actually healthy. So again, how do you apply our psychotherapy and counseling theories to somebody who believes I should be sad? In fact, if I'm not sad, it means I'm actually, I'm not humble. I'm actually understand my real place in this world, how little control I actually have. Um, another example is, is a lot of psychotherapy, a lot of psychiatric drugs, actually all virtually all psychiatric drugs to my knowledge, really focus in on reducing symptoms. So how does that make sense when you're applying it to somebody who is who's accepting or okay with not moving symptoms. There's a lot of documented healing re practices research out there that says you could alleviate suffering, you could alleviate the mental interpretations, but the symptoms haven't changed. Yet the client leaves that healing practice happy and satisfied or fulfilled or with direction in life. But the symptoms that they came in with, all those things on the DSM checklist for whatever disorder you're looking at, those can remain the same. In my um, cross-cultural counseling class, I uh, have an article I get the students to read from my colleague, Joe Trimble, who's at Western Washington University. I was, I was there with him. And he's got this great article about a case study about a woman who, was, who saw a bear and was having uh, hallucinations and delusions around this bear and how she went to Western healers, i.e. psychiatrists, doctors, psychotherapists, and counselors, and how they all really had that frame of a of a psychotic disorder. And they all tried to reduce her uh, hallucinations or control them, you know, but it was really focused in on pathologizing that. And then she went to an indigenous healer who didn't work on reducing that, but giving a different meaning. And through that treatment from the indigenous, uh, the indigenous uh, Native American healer, she came to realize that that Bear in her, that bear in her dreams, that bear she would see all throughout the day was actually her dead spouse looking over her. And so after that understanding and processing, she would still have the hallucinations, so-called hallucinations. She would still see the bear, but it didn't evoke fear, didn't evoke terror, didn't evoke confusion, it evoked comfort. So every time she saw the bear, she felt comforted she felt protected but the symptom the hallucination was always there and so again you can alter the meaning and the client can re resolve their suffering but that doesn't make sense for most psychotherapeutic theories and you can't ignore the fact that a lot of people who could sell traditional healers for the same things that they can go to a psychotherapist for classified as a success even if they don't have their symptoms removed So, other critiques. When you apply culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy, you need to realize that a lot of the research is based on weird samples. We're based, but we're generalizing it to people who are non-Western, less educated, not industrial but agrarian, not rich but poor, and not democratic. And so, anybody who's a researcher here, you know about one of the biggest limitations of research is the sample. How representative is that sample? Now, 
people who are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic are the anomaly. We in the West are an anomaly, yet we're taking research on such a tiny group of people and we're generalizing to the world. Now, I can't remember the exact number, and I know it's increased since I looked at this research, but there was a time maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I came across an article that said something like, if you own a indoor plumbing in your house, in other words, if you have a toilet in your house, you are amongst the wealthiest 20% of people in the world. That's dated research. Maybe it's 30% now. I don't know what the exact number is, but stop and think about that. Virtually everybody you know, I would assume, at least in North America, has a toilet in their house. They are the envy of most of the world who would die, who are aspiring. So no matter how poor you feel, you know, they're, you're an envy to a lot of the world. And so our research is conducted on people who are so atypical, so extreme. Our psychotherapy research is conducted on an extreme population. How could it be generalized to the majority population, which is the opposite of weird? Now, the fact that psychotherapy and counseling is so is as universal, so ubiquitous, you can't even locate studies that look at the efficacy of counseling and psychotherapy that use country as a moderator. There's two meta analyses that attempted to, and they couldn't find that. It's just not research. We tend to just sum up. We tend to add up people together in different countries and treat the intervention as one intervention. <clears throat> and some outcome studies in non-Western countries again show that psychotherapy counseling are less effective. They have lower effect sizes than is typical in Western countries. So if we neglect indigenous strategies and conceptualizations in favor of psychological treatments, we're overlooking influential and time-tested healing resources. So the question is, is, so when should we implement culturally adapted counseling and psychotherapy? Well, I'm proposing that it'll be effective based on the extent that a country's culture is consistent with Western culture and to the extent that, specific, that a specific client adheres to Western understandings. Variables should be considered prior to implementing culture adapted counseling and psychotherapy abroad, but also within North America. You should be assessing variables like Westernization, Western values, acculturation, cultural mistrust, ethnic identity. These are things you need to keep in mind when deciding whether to apply psychotherapy or counseling to somebody in front of you, even if it's in a Western country. Um, I remember some of my colleagues talking about how with the influx of immigrants and refugees coming to Canada, that how they were frustrated because they weren't really appreciating psychotherapy and they were getting psychological treatments for their trauma and everything else that we assumed or assessed that they had but they were frustrated because psychotherapy wasn't being effective and they put the blame on the individual. They didn't understand. And so you need to look at, like, if psychotherapy, if you accept my premise that psychotherapy is embedded in our cultural ways of being and thinking and values and morals and traditions, then it, doesn't make, it may not make sense to other people any more than if you flipped it. So these are variable. We have a study right now that we just submitted for publication that actually identified some scales and assessed whether these variables predict who went to counseling and who would want to go to counseling, and they did. And so more coming on that in the, in the future. So my conclusion is that completely eliminating disparities in counseling and psychotherapy outcomes is overly ambitious and unrealistic. Despite the fact that that's the buzzword, reduce disparities, reduce disparities, be inclusive, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure if we apply that inclusivity, that dis eliminating disparities conceptualization to uh, giving psychological treatments all over the world, to reducing the mental health treatment burden, to, to increasing access and the application of psychiatric drugs and Western psychological treatments all over the world. And I, would, and I say that these racial, ethnic, cultural, and national disparities in counseling and psychotherapy efficacy will remain unless or until we all become one monolithic Euro-American culture, which is sort of happening with globalization. That's why I think more and more people are getting psychotherapy all over the world. And there's, the evidence seems to be getting higher because more and more people are exposed to Western ideas and norms.
I remember about 20 years ago when I was in India for the first time, I was shocked that when we're traveling in between cities, we go to the villages, that people couldn't speak English, but they could all say Coca-Cola, you know, and they could also say names of famous Hollywood actors and actresses, yet, you know, they couldn't really speak English. And so they were obviously exposed to Western media. And so maybe this talk would become irrelevant four or five generations from now for all one kind of culture. But as of right now, there are people who are very non-Westernized. And that becomes my concern when we try to or push or assume we need to provide psychological treatments, Western psychological treatments to them. So counseling and psychotherapy, even if culturally adapted, will never be equally effective for individuals, for all individuals in all the world. And so, as I said, the effectiveness will be constrained by the extent to which individuals subscribe to the cultural meanings and moral visions underlying the Western institutions of counseling and psychotherapy. So non-Western individuals may be no more likely to benefit from counseling and psychotherapy than a Western individual would benefit from a so-called bizarre non-Western indigenous healing practice. So for example, I don't know, let's pick a disorder. So let's say you were diagnosed in, your, in the West and let's say you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder or some other psychiatric disorder and you're a Western individual. And someone comes up to you and says, you know what? I can fix that. Drink this potion and rub your head and your stomach in opposite directions and sing the song and chant. You're going to look at them and say, like, what's wrong with you? Like, how is that? Are you going to fix my biochemical imbalances or fix my, my distorted cognitions or whatever whatever rationale you're giving for your disorder, bipolar, depression, anxiety, PTSD, it just seems bizarre that drinking a potion, dancing, rubbing your stomach, just how would that fix whatever's causing my depression? Now, this is what I was trying to explain to some of my colleagues who are working with the refugees and immigrants. So then how would something that doesn't involve all the entire family put together, doesn't involve community elders, involves talking about your family business with strangers, disclosing your personal conflicts, et cetera, et cetera, that may make just as little sense as somebody who wasn't conditioned that way, who wasn't brought up with that sort of rationale. And actually, I want to, I want to jump ahead, actually, because I have a really good quote. Um, this quote's actually good. If you happen to grow up in a certain culture in which some healing modalities come to you naturally as an indigenous method to alleviate illness, you are more likely to enjoy its efficacy because your belief in the modality itself could contribute to the placebo effect in addition to the method-specific effect, regardless of whether it really manipulates our system the way the healer expects it to. So going back to um, the conclusion there is, just like you, just a first example may seem bizarre to you, to cure your PTSD, what we call counseling and psychotherapy in the, in the infrastructure and the institution and the theories and the rationales could seem just as bizarre to somebody who wasn't brought up with that as a healing setting, wasn't brought up with that rationale and th those interventions. And so now, actually, I'm blocked off here on my screen. Hey, Rob, you are muted. Sorry, I'll try to move my screen here. So um, so I know it was a counseling psychology program here, so I wanted to share some implications of this for counseling and psychotherapy. The first is, is that now it should make sense to you why theories based on contradictory rationales for the same disorder have been proven equally effective on average. How could cognitive behavioral therapy, which says we fix your depression by prioritizing your thinking and changing your, your thinking, how could that be equally effective to something that says, forget about the present, let's go into the past. Let's like psychodynamic, let's resolve your past conflicts. Forget about your thinking. Let's go into your emotional feelings and your reactions. How could both of those be evidence-based empirical support treatments for depression? And that's just one of like 100,000 examples in which counseling theories with contradictory rationales Forget about feelings, focus on thinking, forget about thinking, focus on being. How could they be equally effective on average? Well, it should make sense now from this uh, Frank's model. Also, as you, as you struggle for which theory should I use with this client, I think it's important to remember that 
the truth of any theory and its associative strategies is not as important as the engagement of the client and counselor through a shared understanding. That's more important is that are you a client? Can you client get on the same page? Can you match where the client is at? It doesn't matter which, which theory you're using out of the 300,000 theories out there. It's that engagement. It's if the rational procedures can fit. I mean, you want to fit the client, but you also got to believe it enough or be open to it enough for it to be effective. And so counselors need to be aware of the meaningful cultural myths available and select or tailor one to the client's cultural worldview, circumstances, and preferences. As you'll find in highly religious cultures, religious explanations have the greatest therapeutic rationale fit. But in secular cultures like in the West, it's scientific explanations. And so we you tell your client, this is evidence-based, this is based on research, this is scientific, it engenders the same reaction, positive reaction, as this is consistent with our religion. This is what God or the spiritual figure says. And so an effective counselor is just like any other healer. They're able to provide a culturally acceptable rationale for change that leads to positive expectations for change and hope and therefore client engagement. So then I think a question I've gotten a lot is, well, then how are we different than religious healers or indigenous healers? Well, counselors, psychologists, marriage and family therapists are an outgrowth of the Western zeitgeist and cultural context. Our North American culture has a need for counseling. If the culture evolves significantly, counseling may be replaced as a socially sanctioned healing practice. And ministers and, and indigenous healers capitalize on the same, if you look at Frank's model, for example, and many other models, ministers and healers capitalize on the same or conceptually similar techniques and beliefs effectively used by counselors. Or, since they were doing this before we were, maybe we're actually relying conceptually on the same things that they're doing. The difference is that Western counselors predominantly present stories that adhere to the scientific model that largely fits the broader North American, West European zeitgeist. Indigenous religious healers have different stories and different techniques that better fit the cultural context in which they are effective. Now, just as another example of this, it probably was just like a couple of weeks ago, I saw a commercial and they were advertising, I think they were selling a vehicle or something or something like that. And people in white scientific science coats, lab coats, were part of the commercial to give the aura that something scientific, we believe it, it's truthful. You know, it's science. That has a very strong persuasive effect, which is why you have the word science, research, evidence, people with white lab coats, marketing a whole slew of products that probably have very little to do with an actual person in a scientific lab, traditional scientific lab with chemicals and things like that. But it's very persuasive. It fits our cultural context to call it evidence-based. Not, not realized for many people that what we consider evidence is very, very tiny it's a very tiny definition. So it's evidence of this type based in this way. But it is very effective in North American culture. So our healing practices are scientific or research-based. Um, we wear our lab coats or our shirts and ties to sort of give part of that social influence. Whereas indigenous healers, they're relying on different, different stories, different techniques that fit the different cultural contexts. So... Uh, let me do it for time here. Oh, good. Got some more time. So some caveats. I'm not suggesting that counseling and psychotherapy are completely in superior or inferior to other indigenous approaches to mental healing. It depends on context. I'm also not claiming the indisputable and uniform supremacy of local non-Western healing traditions. Like everything else, they're also going to vary in effectiveness between and uh, within them. And... I'm not making a blanket denouncement against the humble sharing of Western psychological knowledge and methods of local mental health authorities in our Western countries. I know people are concerned about cultural appropriation, but if you look at the anthropological literature, cultures change over time. They're constantly adapting. And what we consider cultural appropriation now was considered very normal hundreds of years ago and part of evolutions of cultures. Every culture of the world has sort of, if you want to use that sort of term, has appropriated something else and internalized it and modified it. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't share our psychological knowledge, shouldn't share our counseling and psychotherapy, but it's got to be shared humbly with respect for other indigenous psychologies out there.
And actually, so we have some, I have five more minutes. So um, I want to talk about some couple more things and so I have five more minutes. Uh, the first thing is, is that, so what are some of the barriers? How come we're not accepting these indigenous healing practices of all over the world? And when I say indigenous, I know in Canada in particular, we tend to refer to the First Nations people, peoples, um, but I'm talking indigenous in more of an anthropological way, which is sort of like the originators in, a, in, a, in an area. So indigenous doesn't mean First Nations, for example. It really means people indigenous to a certain part of the world. So what are some of these barriers? Well, the growing dominance of the Western biomedical paradigms globally over alternative viewpoints, such as karma-based or mystical ontologies of mental disorders, may be more a function of power and privilege. We have the power, we have the privilege, we have the money to promote our view of reality in the West. Who has the authority to define and what counts as evidence and the money to provide the proof? We tend to have a lot of biochemical, biological innovations in, in psychological or mental health disorder research because that's where the vast route of funding goes. So we have the vast amount of money to provide research that conforms to our psychological Western perspectives. Also, Western science has been preoccupied with its search for universal knowledge claims as part of original psychology, looking for generality, generalizable terms, generalizable concepts, you know, generalizable findings, and fail to recognize that our traditional Western psychology's epistemological positions are assumptions, not facts. And a lot of psychology really doesn't appreciate a social constructionist view of reality and mental health. We need to let go of the culturally sanctioned postulate that psychiatric medications and psychological treatments are universally the most legitimate forms of mental health treatment. Again, that completely contradicts the World Health Organization's mental health treatment gap program. But I think they need to realize that mental disorders, what's considered a disorder, is culturally constructed. Now, I also know that uh, I can't find the reference, I don't have the reference handy, but if you look at North American culture, when a child's born with Down syndrome, trisomy 21, so it, an extra gene on the 21st chromosome, it's often accompanied by feeling sad or feeling sympathetic towards the family, but it's sort of accompanied by, you know, like, like I wish it didn't happen. I wish I'm going to accept it. I'll love my child, but, you know, wishing it didn't happen. Other people feeling bad for the life you have to go through. Now, I remember reading about some historical cultural accounts in which in that place, in that village or that town, if your child was born with Down syndrome, you were celebrated. You were, you were like, you were the, the, the villages, the towns, like they were envious. Like, I wish my child was born like that because you now have a child who will never leave the nest, who will always be there with mama and papa, for example, will always be there with the parents. You have a child who's eternally happy, who's a you have a child who doesn't tend to sweat some of these small things, who just brings joy, and the culture meanings around that were very different. It was seen as like a blessing. Another example from another thing I read in anthropological literature was children who were born with Down syndrome were seen as descendants of I think it was jaguars, so they were afforded extra care, extra support, and extra reverence because they were seen as a direct descendant of a jaguar. Anthropologists said because the face sometimes resembled the jaguar of a Down syndrome face, but regardless of that, that's a very different cultural meaning. And so we need to keep that in mind, that our mental health disorders are constructed based on our Western traditions of knowledge. Another thing which I think we tend to lack as a culture in general in the Western culture is humility. We need to have more cultural humility. Um, everybody, actually, guess, I'm, 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 let's see if I can see something here. Nope. Uh, you can't, well, there you go. See that, see that remote control here? I'll give you an example here. This remote control, I just dropped it. It fell to the ground. Oops, I also want to slide. It dropped to the ground. Now, what caused that? Why did, when I dropped the remote control, it dropped to the ground? Well, most you're going to adopt the Western theory of gravity, of gravity, right? That, you know, gravity says there's a pull towards the Earth's core. And so if I drop this remote control, boom, 
gravity explains why the it, it fell to the ground. Okay, let me give a different uh, thing. Let's test another theory. I believe that there are demons in the middle of the earth, fiery demons, and they're hungry, and they try to bring food, any item, to the core of the earth. So my theory would predict that if I drop this, if I have it, I let go of this, it'll drop to the ground because there's demons trying to eat it. Let's test my theory. Oh, look, my theory supported. So that's the example aside. What I'm trying to say is, is whatever explanation is adopted, we need to accept that there are multiple explanations that can be made for the same effectiveness of an intervention or lack of effectiveness or any theory. Any explanation we give, there's going to be more than one way of explaining it. And we have to realize that there's power and privilege in how we can promote our definitions, our knowledge, our theories and stories to the mental health field. And so what should we do instead of just, you know, ravenously just promoting our Western psychological groups all over the world to all the villages, to all the countries, to remote, remote people who have real contact with Western people. Well, alternative one is focusing on pre-existing cultural congruence. In other words, let's look at um, how this particular theory fits with other cultures. For example, this was some great conceptual work done by uh, Jeswinder Sandhu, who's a former student of mine, that I supervised in my graduate program uh, many years ago. And he talked about how existential counseling and psychotherapy theory fit really well with the Sikh religion and how there's lots of overlap and similarities. So he kind of proposed that if you're going to provide psychotherapy, somebody who is who's strongly sick in, in their religious understandings, that approach might be more acceptable because you can draw analogies between existential theory and the religious tenets. So alternative one is focus on what cultural groups or religious groups are have can overlap in some way with a certain particular counseling or psychotherapy theory. Number two, collaboration with traditional heels that equals. Now I've read about a, read about a dozen articles, and they talk about collaboration with traditional healers, but in almost every single case, there was an implied or explicitly stated superiority of the Western healing method, psychotherapy, psychiatric drugs, um, they really weren't on equal footing. One of, the, one of the articles I read was kind of talking about, well, we really want to give them these psychiatric drugs, we want to give them these behavioral interventions, but they're not going to accept it unless they know that we're in line or in tandem with their, you know, their respected religious healers. So it's almost like they brought religious healers on board to get compliance. It was like a means to an end as opposed to an honest Let's kind of look and we both have valuable those things to give here and we're equals. Most of the articles I read don't take that perspective of equality even when they try to collaborate. There's even a small amount of research that shows success. Um, so there's, there's success when Western model methods are prioritized, but I think it'd be more successful with, with more parity. And there's a couple of references there that talk about how it can actually be effective with parity. Alternatives three, is using traditional healers to provide culturally congruent psychological interventions. Take out the whole theories, the whole little, you know, take a theories of counseling textbook, take out everything else in there, just pull out the stuff that's, that's culturally already consistent and use the people who have the authority, use the people who have the respect, the people who are sort of afforded the healing setting. That would be another sort of pathway forward there. So, and I think that's it for me. So. Uh, thank you so much for uh, attending my talk. Thank you, Dr. Betty, for your wonderful talk. It was really wonderful hearing from you. I know I get to hear from you frequently being in your lab, but it was always wonderful to hear how you speak when you are in a webinar. So thank you for that. If you have questions, we have more time for you to submit them into the Q&A. We have a couple already there that I'll go ahead and read out, and Dr. Betty can um, make an effort to answer the questions. Uh, the first question is from Christina, and they say, you make excellent points about small sample size for Western treatment methods and implementing those across the world, but you seem to imply that Western methods work for Western patients. This does not seem to be the case at all. That is not all Western patients benefit either. So perhaps we need an even more fine-grained approach to figure out what works for whom. Mm 
Yes, and thank you for that question. Uh, given the time limitation, I was kind of overgeneralizing a little bit, but you're right that even psychotherapy doesn't work for every single individual. First, there's going to be individual differences in skill level, right? Uh, there's also individual differences in personality and style. And so many times what doesn't work, if the client shops around and finds different practitioners, sometimes what does end up working later on is a different practitioner or a different skill level, different style. There's also probably 30,000 or 300,000 theories out there. And so, again, it's about a match in that way. With that said, no one's – I'm talking here in, like, averages. So, on average, if you apply psychotherapy, you'll be – on average, you'll be more effective with somebody who's brought up in the West, born and raised, you know, really identifies as, as, as Canadian or American, you know, endorses those sort of common values – they'll be the prototypical person who's going to be benefiting. But those are dichotomies. Those are dichotomies. And so when you look at assessing things, it's westernization is not, shouldn't really be a dichotomy. It's how westernized your lifestyle is. Western values. Well, there's a scale of Western values, and I think it assesses like 30 or 35 values. No one scores strongly agree to every single one of them. So there's going to be variability even within the Western culture. Um, ethnicity. Also, like even ethnicity, but also um, uh, even variables like dual identities. So research, whereas traditionally, we used to make a dichotomy. The research traditionally was Asian values versus European values. That was a lot of the research out there. It was like one or the other. And based on that assumption, a lot of the research didn't really overlap. We assessed one or the other. A lot of the research in the last 10 or 15 years has sort of said, well, you can have both values exist. And so again... Some Western individuals may have some Eastern ideas or values or philosophies or principles. And so it does become an individual differences variable. And what we actually submitted in our article was taking people and actually assessing those on a continuum. And so I'm trying to think, we assessed Western lifestyle on a scale, like how much Western lifestyle you live, the clothes you dress, the media you consumed, et cetera, et cetera. We got a scale score there. We looked at their ethnic identity. Um, you know, how you define ethnically or nationally. We also looked at how much pride and identification they felt. Just because you say you're American, it may not be a proud thing for you, or you may not value that identity. So we assessed that uh, collective self-esteem. We assessed um, cultural mistrust. Um, we assessed Asian values. We assessed, it was, it was a, we assessed uh, European-American values. So we assessed a whole bunch of variables on a continuum, and we found that you know, some of them predict better than others, but we found that uh, we could predict that who would be willing, open to go to psychotherapy, who, who accepted it as a treatment method, who would think it would help them. We haven't got to the point in which we have funding to actually give them psychotherapy. There's ethical issues involved in pushing people to psychotherapy, uh, may never be able to be done in, in, in a randomized clinical trial way, but we do have information on uh, treatment attitudes, treatment intentions, and so the more somebody is on that scale, higher up on those variables, assuming the clinician is skillful and assuming they have the right interpersonal match with the clinician, the clinician is able to develop a good relationship and assuming they have the right Western theory that fits their conceptual understanding. Even within the West, there's a reason we have like 30,000 plus the counseling theories because everyone sort of fits a certain client's understanding of the world which is conceptually the same thing as a non-Indigenous or a non-Western theory of, of healing as well. And so there is important, I'm glad you sort of recognize that the individual differences between people there. So thank you so much for that question, uh, Christina. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Rebecca, who asks two questions. Um, do you know whether the studies in the US, Canada, Europe, showing disparities in outcome for REM versus white majority people have controlled for socioeconomic status? Uh, the ones I looked at, the three or four have not, but we again have uh, two studies currently undergoing and actually, well, they're done. We collected the data and we did actually control for uh, socioeconomic status. So we actually did a, a global study. So we looked at, uh, so it's not quite US, Canada, Europe. Uh, we looked at uh, the country over the world. And so our, our population was countries. And we were able to, uh, we, we did assess and we tried to partial out socioeconomic status of the country. 
Um, we looked at it two different ways we looked at it. One was uh, GNI, global national income, and I think one was GDP. And on both definitions of income, we sort of found that westernization, all the westernization predicted above and beyond income, uh, utilization of psychotherapy, acceptance of psychotherapy, you know, and a bunch of other different variables, writing about psychotherapy. Um, and so not at the individual level in Western countries, but we took a global perspective. And so we have two studies that we've done. One was a small pilot study and one is an actual full scale study. And in which we looked, I think we looked at like 60, like 80 countries of the world. And so if I can assume that that pattern will apply uh, when you look at it within the West. Um, I think there are some studies that have looked at uh, socioeconomic status, but I really, and I, but I think they're here and there. I have not come across a meta-analysis that really talks about that. Not say that it doesn't exist, just I'm not aware of that. I've been focusing a lot of my research recently more on cross-cultural rather than multicultural. And so multicultural is kind of within Western countries and different cultures. I have become more interested in looking at other countries and between countries. So. Okay, and then her the a second question from Rebecca. Um, you might have answered this already. At some, I think you did a bit. Um, but they asked, "What do you think are the key ingredients or mediators through which psychotherapy works for Western individuals, but does not work for non-Western people? What are the underlying assumptions, perspectives, or experiences that make therapy work in Western contexts, but not others?" Yeah. So I think it goes back. We don't have. I think essentially what we need to do. And people haven't done this because it just shows how ubiquitous psychotherapy seen as universal is we need to have more research actually examining what are the Western cultural components of psychotherapy? What are the values of the West? What are the norms? What are the intellectual traditions? What are the morals that are embedded within the institution of psychotherapy? Everything from like being away from your family, like talking about your personal business with other people to the setting it's usually like a sterile setting, you know, it's confidential, um, you know, doors closed. Um, I remember couples have gone to India and done pro bono counseling. And when I first went, I kind of learned that lesson that uh, I tried to get to take the person to a separate room and they were confused. Why are you doing that? My mom and dad are right here. Bring them, they should be here with me, you know? And, and it just sort of was an aha moment that how I was kind of taking that Western understanding, assuming that the client wanted confidentiality, for example. Um, I've also talked to some of my colleagues there who do who are school counselors, and you know they do school counseling, sitting on the stairs, with people walking by, you know, and so you know, or like it's just it's very very different, and so I think um, we need some research to really get at what are the Western like what is what is the Western embedded within counseling and psychotherapy, the theories, the institution, the practices, the structure, and we need to sort of go down that pathway. I've started bridging that by looking at some variables. Um, you know, like I said, we looked at like Western values. Uh, but the problem is, is not every Western value on that scale is a value relevant to psychotherapy and counseling. So, but I think Western values, Western lifestyle, Western norms, trusting Western culture and cultural products. I think those are some of the variables. And then also then the other counterparts, you know, non-Western values a non-Western ethnic identity, um, you know, are these sort of variables I think is important. And so the article that we, we just submitted, we're actually proposing that counselors do an assessment of some of these things. We did put some scales down, but we know it's quite tedious to like give scales for everything to clients, but even making an informal assessment of those variables and then deciding, is this client a good match for psychotherapy? Uh, do they need another healing practice? Should I consult or have them work in tandem with their religious healers? I mean, I do that in my private practice. You know, when I get a client who's highly religious, I oftentimes use them as the go-between between me and their spiritual healer. And I want to hear what the spiritual healer has to say about what, and want to hear what, you know, what they have to say about what I'm doing, what they recommend the client do. And I think that shows respect, but it also sort of shows that they're not fully buying into the Western ways of being and understanding. And so how can I put forth a Western theory? I would go back to Frank's model. How can I give them a Western rationale when they are probably induced to believe a different rationale, my intervention is going to be nonsense to them. And so I think those are the kind of variables, um, those mediators or moderators um, that I think would be important to understand. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lauren asks, can you speak to the institutional systemic and regulatory challenges faced by practitioners wanting to be culturally sensitive in their service delivery? <laughs> 
Yeah, and so the, this is where I pretty much diverge from the majority of where the American Psychological and Canadian Psychological Associations are going. They're taking a stance and make everybody more and more culturally sensitive, culturally aware, culturally competent. They they're basically want you to be experts in as many cultures as possible. Learn the ones that you don't, you know, it's a, it's a lifelong process. Learn the ones that you're not familiar with to, to best serve the clients in front of you, get supervision, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then they're basing it on if we just culture adapt psychotherapy more, it'll be more effective. And so, I actually think we can only go so far with that, as my my whole talk is based on that premise. And so, I think we need to partially psychotherapy and counseling alone realize that it's one out of many healing practices out there. And we can't be everything to everybody. The more Westernized they are, the more this is a great healing practice. And so I think you got to be somewhat culturally sensitive, but then you have to sort of realize that you're probably only going to be effective with people who have reasonable acculturation to Western norms and values and ideas. Like when I teach cultural psychology or cultural counseling as, as a class, you know, students oftentimes have that stereotype that, hey, you know, because most texts are geared towards this. You read about the culture, the culture's norms, values, their principles, their history, you know, the structural oppressions they face. And then the students tend to assume that the client who walks in the door buys into all that. Now, my private practice where I see my clients is in Surrey, British Columbia, which is where the largest population of uh, uh, Indo-Canadians, uh, Canadians of South Asian Indian descent, particularly ones from the state of Punjab, live. I'm like dead center in that part of town. And so a lot of my clients are South Asian or, you know, when they come to my office. But honestly, for most of the clients I work with, I pretty much do something very similar to what I do with everybody else with a couple small tweaks because they were highly westernized in, in some ways. They bought it to the system. And so I actually think sometimes it's overdone. I think like they're almost, almost times uh, the reifying, overly reifying culture as stagnant, but they're also making, I think almost in a sense, raci- like, I wonder when it was, I'm trying to think of the best word here though. The word that comes to mind is racial essentialism, which is actually racism in a, in, a, in a way that's actually socially accepted nowadays. But you have to make assumptions that these people are like that. And I think that's where getting for regular, you know, getting regulation, getting laws, getting all the ethics things there, I sometimes pushes people too far and kind of it's that implicit assumption of racial or ethnic essentialism. I think we can have some cultural adaptations, but then realize that psychotherapy is not and Kowski is not for everybody. And I think if we can respect and value alternative healing practices, that would be the way to go. I remember I was working with a nonprofit and we applied for a grant, a project grant, a service grant, and we wanted to make a treatment team. And on the treatment team where we had an Ayurvedic doctor, we had, we had an a, a, a addictionologist, we had a social worker, we had a counselor, we had an Ayurvedic doctor, Ayurveda is a sort of South Asian Indian traditional healing approach. And we had a yoga person, a yoga coach, but not yoga a la touch your toes, yoga as in like a PhD in yogic science, teaching about the philosophy of life. And the government was not in support of bringing on yoga and uh, Ayurvedic doctors to the treatment consultation team. And I think we need to recognize that psychotherapy is a cultural healing practice. It is one useful thing, but, you know, it's only useful for people who are relatively westernized in some in, in some fashion. And so I think it should actually put less pressure on having to adapt to be culture sensitive in every single way because for, for a group of people, I think more and more people, I'm finding in British Columbia, psychotherapy is less and less helpful, less and less relevant because of the influx of refugees and immigrants that we have. And so if we keep tailoring it and tailoring it though, one, we keep losing the fact that it still has embedded westernism, isn't it? In a sense, when you promote any psychotherapy theory that you use, in a sense, your social influencing is almost colonizing their thinking about their disorder or their life problems. And so I think the intention is great, just like I think the intention of the World Health Organization and their, and their MH GAP program is great. You know, And I think the intention wants to be culturally sensitive, but then realizing that, well, you want to be culturally, you want to be culturally tailoring your practice of a Western healing practice to a non-Western person. It's never going to be, I think it's overly ambitious. I think we can do that though. So I kind of went on a better tangent there, Lauren. I hope that answered uh, enough of your question to satisfy you. Okay, next question is from Devo Priya. Uh, 
um, who acknowledges that she lives in India. And in my training with clients, this is what she says, from a marginalized community within India, mainly poverty-based concerns, existentialism was something recommended that I could use. In a country where individuals are more concerned about where their next meal will come from, finding meaning within life, one of the tenets of existentialism, might work better than focusing on thoughts and behavior, or CBT. How would you say something like existentialism and cross-cultural practices can be combined to help these marginalized individuals? Okay, uh, Deborah Peer, thank you for attending from India. I'm going to go there in a couple of weeks. I think it's a 12 and a half hour time difference. So I think you're attending at 2 in the morning or 2.30 in the morning so uh, or 1.30 in the morning. So thank you so much for staying up late here. I need to read your question over again because there's a lot there. Just give me a second here. Um, in a country where individuals are working. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think, uh, so your question, how would you say something like existentialism and cross-cultural practices can be combined to help those marginalized individuals? Well, the, the articles by, he's got a couple articles, but the articles by um, by the, the person I mentioned earlier, uh, Jasvinder Sandhu, really talks about, it's not just Sikhism, but how a lot of existential really is about that deeper philosophy. Um, but at the same time, you have, so it fits a kind of broader culture but if you take like a Maslow's perspective, if people have basic human needs that they need to satisfy, it's tougher to kind of get into that deeper understanding of psychotherapy. Now, a lot of people kind of say, you know, I've heard people joke about this is that when everything else is going good in life, then you have time to worry about these things that Westerners worry about. I mean, I'm actually, I'm actually at a psychotherapy conference right now um, in, in Colorado and we're over lunch. I think yesterday there's been some jokes going around about uh, like, how um, people in the West now get traumatized by something that's considered very minuscule by many people in the world. And you have people who've gone through their houses blown up and like gone through like real terror zones and war zones. And they seem to be much more resilient and coping much more better than somebody who like, and I think the bad, the bad joke was somebody stubbed their toe, you know, by kicking a chair when they walked by and they got PTSD was I think the one of the jokes that was sort of going around. And so, you know, we're, we're rushing us aside here. I think the meaning was is that um, I think the meaning behind that was is stuff that you have when you have basic human needs, these other things are, are luxuries that you don't that are, don't even matter. Only when those are satisfied can you deal with some of these larger issues. And so um, Deborah Priya says, and in, in a country where individuals are more concerned about where the next meal will come from, finding meaning within life might work better than focusing on thoughts and behaviors. And so again, that kind of fits with the broader Indian philosophy is a lot of it's about meaning. It's, again, it's about like, you can't necessarily stop poverty. But the research that really influences me is, the funny thing is, is a lot of countries of the world that are poorer than the United States and Canada are happier countries. I mean, that's kind of bizarre because we have everything. We all have toilets pretty much, I would assume, in North America here. You know, our poverty, you take the people like downtown east side of Vancouver, and they still live better than many people in the world. And so these people can't necessarily, you know, you can't CBT their way out of this, focusing on their thoughts and behaviors and their rational beliefs, but giving them different meaning. A lot of people from other cultures are still able to find happiness, and they have so much less than we do in North America. And so I do think it's an important point to keep in mind, but it kind of also highlights the cultural context. And if you're going to adapt counseling and psychotherapy, kind of thing, that meaning in life perspective, which as Jesuit Sandhu kind of says, existentialism is something that he expects would fit better with a lot of South Asian Indian people, particularly the ones in India who are very, you know, very, very into the traditional philosophy, I uh, would probably find that very valuable. So thank you so much for that question. And again, I'm so pleased that someone's here at, uh, you know, two, three in the morning, uh, in the morning. So thank you. Well, you've got four minutes left till we're supposed to be done. Do you want to try answering another question or? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll give shorter answers. Um, I'm not okay, sure if I'll get to everybody's fine. question. And I did notice that at least a couple people put a question into the chat, not into the question and answer period. So we're not going to get to all the questions, but uh, please stick around for the chat. I will be there and happy to answer questions, but more it's about talking and facilitating discussion as a group. Uh, let me quickly... Uh, why don't you keep me on track here? So we got four minutes, you said? Yeah. Do you want to... The yeah, next I'll, I'll question is here. by 
Yeah, Jessica? Uh, Jessica, let's see here. Um, for individuals with high colonial mentality, did you find in the literature that their belief in an idolized West previous boosts the efficacy of psychotherapy? Um, yeah, so I'm hypothesizing that, and I currently have a thesis student, and we have a project that, we ju that we're just writing up the, uh, we're just conceptualizing right now, and we're actually looking at it in the Philippines. And we're going to kind of assess that people who are very, are very have, have, have a strong colonial mentality in the Philippines, who really see themselves have internalized inferiority of the Filipino culture and see the Western culture as superior, better, or, en or envious of it. We want to assess their willingness, acceptability, and their support of psychotherapy and counseling over other traditional healing practices. So, so I think your thinking is in line with mine. I haven't found as strong literature on that related to psychotherapy, but I do believe that that's going to be found is that if you idolize the Western treatments or the Western culture, you will be more open to taking it, believing, and it's going to be more effective. And we have the first study in that program that we're conceptualizing right now. So thank you so much. Um, next up is uh, David. Yes. David seems to be more like a comment than a question. Okay, but I think it's a good point that studies have shown that the same message from a physician and a lab coat are, um, oops, scroll back up here, are more credible than physician street clothes. Now, and there's talk about evolutionary psychology. There's actually psychology literature about that as well. Some of the work by Stanley Strong on social influence talks about the psychotherapist as a social influencer and how that the more credible they can be, the more they can persuade the client to take on their viewpoint, their theory, their explanation. And so we even have research psychology that says that, which is why we stand behind the cloak of science in, in psychotherapy research to give us, you know, to make it buy into our way of being, which may seem quite acceptable in the Western context, but people have said that's colonization of thinking when you try to like use your influence subtly to make somebody who doesn't believe those things buy into the Western way of conceptualizing disorder, disease, um, counseling and psychotherapy. Um, uh, is, uh, next one uh, about uh, racial essentialism. What can we do? As, and I'm actually familiar with with uh, Yi's work. So, what can we do as a profession to educate practitioners about racial essentialism in practice? I think we have to have these discussions because in so much there's so much racism and racial essentialism, but it's become like a culturally appropriate way of looking at things. And I think it gets into the cross-cultural literature that we just assume and we essentialize races and ethnicities. And then we all have these trains we all go to about learning about cultures and culture adapting. And we lose the variability that, that occurs within cultures. Um, I'm going to take one last one, Teresa, because I know we want to uh, switch over. So if you didn't get your questions answered, please uh, stick around and go to the chat. And it might be useful, Teresa, you put the link back into the chat. Eric. Um, Is there any effort by psychotherapists who are respected by institutions to popularize the effectiveness of other healing methods? Not very much. I mean, the, the, people, the person that comes to mind contemporarily is Bruce Wampold. Um, he's got the uh, contextual model of psychotherapy. And one of his three ways that psychotherapy works is on expectations and really pulling from the Frank and Frank work. And so it's really not a mainstream perspective and if you look at the World Health Organization, some of the literature I just find so disrespectful. Some of it comes across almost like we're going to culturally adapt this just so we can get them in the door because they're not even going to come to our Western treatments. They, they're not even going to get better as we get them in the door. So we have to kind of like put the icing so it fits. And they always talk, almost talk about cultural adaptation as, a, as really we're doing this to get the client to do the real stuff, the real work, the real therapy stuff. And so it's really not that, pers I mean, Look at all the literature out there, evidence-based treatments, you know, culturally adapted treatments, taking them all over the world, the World Health Organization. Really, the, the, the mainstream perspective really is, is that these are things that can go everywhere and not seeing them as indigenous cultural healing of the sort of traditional Euro-American West. So, okay, I'm going to stop it there because I don't want to keep you on time, Teresa. Okay, we will close now. It's 2.31 my time. Thank you all so much for joining a special thank you to Rob for his presentation today. Dr. Betty, we're very grateful for your talk and all the knowledge that you shared today.
Uh, another thank you to the Heterodox Academy for supporting us and providing the, the funding as well as funding from the counseling psychology area at UBC. Um, this was our last talk of the speaker series. For those of you who've been able to join multiple, thank you so much. Very appreciated of the support that we've received over the last couple of months of the speaker series. And that's all we have today. Thank you.